Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on increasing efficiency of CRISPR edited cell line development. I'm Lisa, and I will be your moderator for this session. We're delighted to have you with us for what promises to be a very informative and engaging discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Jessica Hartman. Dr. Hartman is the Senior Director of Applications at Cell Microsystems. She brings a rich background in biology and molecular cancer biology, holding a BS in biology from the University of Virginia and a PhD from Duke University. Her postdoctoral training spans biochemistry and cancer biology at both Baylor College of Medicine and Duke University. With extensive experience in directing bioscience research and development for biotechnology companies, Dr. Hartman is now leading the charge in developing new and streamlined workflows at Cell Microsystems. Her insights today are sure to be invaluable for anyone working in the field of CRISPR technology and cell line development. Before we start, a few quick reminders. This webinar presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature, and we'll address as many as we can during the Q&A session. Also, this session is being recorded for future access, and we will be sharing a link to it in a couple of days after the webinar. With that, I'm excited to hand over the virtual stage to Dr. Jessica Hartman. Thank you, Lisa, for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. So today I'm going to talk to you about how you can increase the efficiency of your CRISPR and gene editing cell line development workflows. And what I hope you're going to take away from this session are a few key learning objectives. Uh, the first of which is a discussion of the common methods for generating edited cell lines and the pros and cons associated with each of those. And then how you can, in your own lab, develop CRISPR edited cell lines faster by introducing a novel technology called the cell wrap technology. I'm gonna cover some case studies and some use cases with the technology that allow us to identify and isolate clones from even rare populations of cells or rare edits and how we and our users have generated CRISPR knockout and knock-in stem cell lines, and then are ultimately able to automate the isolation and characterization of hundreds of CRISPR-edited clones for doing research at scale. Now, if you're joining me today, you probably have a keen interest and already some familiarity with how you go about doing gene editing in a cell line. But as you can see here in this uh, cartoon, it's not necessarily a straightforward decision how you go about beginning this process. On the left-hand side of the illustration, you can see some common methods for getting genes into a cell, and they range from uh, large and complex to simple and small. Uh, for example, transposon-based transduction uh, uses large DNA molecules, and you can see in the green and the red here some pros and cons associated with each of these methods. For the transposons, they have a low genotoxicity, but because they're so large, they have an inefficient delivery system, and you're only able to put things into cells. You're not able to deplete them or not them out. At the bottom of the list is the most recent darling and the most uh, common addition to the list these days, which is CRISPR gene editing. CRISPR editing uses small RNA molecules by introducing a guide RNA and an endonuclease to induce an edit. It's very efficient and highly scalable, but the con is that it does have a higher risk of off-target mutations as well as a lack of homozygosity in your mutation requiring further downstream characterization. Now, regardless of what gene editing method you choose, be it DNA or nuclease or RNA, uh, the next step is for you to figure out how to actually get that material into your cell type of interest. And you can see some of those delivery technologies on the right side of the screen. Now, if I were a cell, most of these methods would probably strike fear in my heart because none of them are particularly amenable to cell viability or cells being happy after you've done that. And you can kind of tell that from the cartoon. Uh, they range from the viral methodology, where you're using a lentivirus or a retrovirus to insert your gene of interest. These methods are highly efficient. They allow you to have stable transduction, but they do carry with them a higher risk of genotoxicity, and they're not particularly well suited for clinical applications or in vivo applications where you don't want potentially having viral particles persisting in your cell line. Electroporation or nucleofection is a very high efficiency process for getting these type of gene edits into your cell because you're basically puncturing the membrane of the cell in order to get these small molecules into the cell type itself. But unfortunately, that high degree of voltage causes a lot of cytotoxicity. You've essentially punched holes in the cell, rendering it vulnerable to uh, degradation and cell death. 
And lastly, you've probably been familiarized with uh, nanoparticle-based transduction, either using a polymer or more commonly a lipid-based methodology. These methods have a very low cytotoxicity with high cell viability, but in general, they have a poor efficiency, which makes the edit of a choice much harder to find. So you can imagine, depending on what combination of gene editing and delivery technology that you choose, your road to cell line development could be quite easy or it could be quite challenging. And again, the choice of these is very dependent on your application as well as your cell type of choice. If you're using a common cell line development cell type, one of the workhorses like a CHO or a hex cell, uh, it may not be particularly bothersome to you that viability might be compromised or that your efficiency might be low. But if you're working with a primary cell or a stem cell or a rare patient cell, that viability, that high degree of efficiency is going to matter very much to you. So uh, really this choice is gonna dictate a lot of your downstream success. But regardless of what methodology you choose, it all starts in the dish. Uh, the first step is to plate your cells of choice in a standard tissue culture dish, provide that external stimulus in your edit of choice, and then allow your cells to either undergo some sort of drug selection or fluorescence selection, and then expansion of your population. Once the cells have recovered, the cells then get removed from the plate, typically by trypsinization, turned into a cell suspension, and then dispensed into a 96-well plate for downstream characterization. Once you have dispensed your edited putative cell population into those 96-well plates or 384-well plates, you then have to wait and hope that the cells that you've edited have survived and were able to recapitulate a fully functional cell line with your gene edit of choice that can then be used for the actual science that you care about. Now, it's lovely to show this diagram as a linear path from A to Z, but if you've ever done this workflow like I have, you're probably keenly aware that it is rarely a straight line from point A to point Z. And more often than not, those arrows go back and forth between each other and they circle around in a loop and you don't always necessarily get the edit that you want very quickly, despite having a lot of tools and technologies at your disposal. So when you are actually getting to the point where you have an edited population and you wanna turn that population of cells into single cells for dispensing or for, for clonal expansion, you have a couple of options available to you. Uh, the first of which is probably the most familiar, certainly uh, all of us have done it, uh, is manual limiting dilution. This takes a stack of 96 well plates. You fill those plates with a single cell per well using a manual multi-channel pipetter. The advantages of this method are that it's very quick, very inexpensive from a cost perspective. Uh, it's pretty labor intensive as the con and the low efficiency is really the biggest issue. You're going to put a lot of cells on these plates but only a very small number of them are gonna potentially give you the clone that you want. To overcome that, many labs have turned to more advanced technologies like high-speed fluidic-based sorters. These sorters are incredibly powerful tools that allow you to screen thousands and millions of cells at a time using high-complex fluorescent tagging to generate that suspension of choice. So you're able to screen very rapidly, particularly if you have a rare edit and you need to look through a lot of cells at one time. The con of these instruments is that you're taking that already fragile, vulnerable cell population that has been poked and prodded and squeezed and electroporated, and now you're running it through a high pressure sorter, subjecting the cells to further stress through a microfluidics, where they're then dispensed as droplets into 96 well plates. In addition, they have a very high cost burden, both for upfront instrumentation cost, as well as access to cores and other resources where you're paying per hour to use the instruments. A more recent entry into this space are your uh, low pressure droplet dispensers, as you can see here. Uh, for example, uh, these, these low pressure fluid exhorters are using low PSIs to improve cell viability and to improve uh, outcomes on the back end, but that comes at a trade off of scale. Because that low pressure allows for better cell viability, the ability to screen large number of cells is not as available to you. So uh, we wanted to kind of get a sense of what's happening in the scientific field and really what people are using in their own labs to do cell line development and what their pain points are in these workflows. I obviously have my own personal biases. I've done all of these workflows, but we wanted to see what was actually happening in the research field. So in a poll of the biopharma industry, uh, we found that the vast majority of researchers, despite having access to other technologies, are still doing manual limiting dilution, even at the biggest pharma companies. Um, so almost 
almost 70% of users are still doing limiting dilution. Uh, about the same percentage are using high-speed sorters, and a much smaller fraction are using these newer uh, low-pressure-based sorters. For my math whizzes in the audience, you can quickly tell this does not add up to 100%, which means that many of our users are, are, are using multiple different technologies to get to the endpoint. So it's not just the limiting dilution or sorting. You have to go through all of these different approaches in order to get to your endpoint. So I'm gonna pause briefly for a poll question to pop up on your screen. I'd love to know what you're doing in your own lab and what is a pain point for you uh, in your workflows and how many clones uh, you actually need for your project to be successful. So in addition to this uh, poll talking about technologies that we were using, uh, we also wanted to get a sense of where those pain points were happening uh, in, the, in the research field. And by the vast majority, you can see in the left-hand side of this graph, uh, all of the researchers kind of came down to two main things. One is that gene editing is a highly inefficient process, and two, that it takes a tremendous amount of time. And so these are kind of corollaries to each other. If it's inefficient, it's going to take a long time. And again, as a companion to these, all of these other pain points start to kind of fall out. You don't get the number of clones that you need, so you have to repeat these exercises over and over again. You're using a lot of reagents, plastic wear, media, tips, tubes, etc., to get to the end point. And at the end of the day, after all of this, you're left with a lot of 96 well plates. You have no guarantee that that colony was actually derived from a single cell, and you have to do a lot of expensive downstream characterization to prove that it was a clone, and indeed that it has the edit that you actually want. And what that means for most of the folks uh, who took this survey is that typically for a given experiment where you're trying to achieve just one gene edit, you're screening anywhere between 10 and over 100 clones to identify just one that's right for your workflow. So I've already told you about several places this workflow can become a pain point. Uh, we know that the cells are going to be fragile and uh, gentle and, and need some gentle handling after they've been manipulated and edited. You then are gonna introduce more stress to them after they go through some of these manual or automated technologies where they're being flown as a cell suspension through some sort of tubing or tip, et cetera. But really the crux of it, after all of this manipulation, after all of the aspiration and pipetting and editing and whatnot, what you're really left with at the core in all three of the technologies that I showed you is a single cell in a well. And that cell has had a long road to get there. It's gone through all of these manipulations. And then we as biologists are asking that cell to do the incredibly Herculean job of recapitulating the entire population. And so the odds are that you're going to not have that happy dish of cells that are edited, but more likely than not, you're going to have a dead cell in a well. And because of that, that single cell is not ever going to turn into the colony that you want because it's gone through just too much. And so all of the things it's been subjected to have rendered it unable to generate the colonies that you need. So today, what I'm gonna to talk to you about how is how in my lab, uh, we have a saying that we never culture single cells again and why you should never have to culture a single cell again. At the core of the technology is uh, the cell raft array. It is a traditional cell culture dish uh, with a few key differences, and we'll talk about that momentarily. As you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen, the cell raft array allows you to perform flask-like culture of your edited populations, but it also enables for single cell spatial resolution of your entire population. While your cells are growing on the array, they can be imaged over time using the instrument, the cell raft air system, which allows you to perform temporal scans, image every single cell within the array itself, follow them over time, and then determine if they're the cells that you want using the software, the cell raft cytometry software. This software lets us do image-based software guided selection that allows us to narrow down the cells of interest to a population that fits our criteria. And then once we're ready to actually characterize and retrieve those colonies, it's going to happen fully automated on the instrument. And we'll talk a bit more about how this happens in detail in a few slides. But the key takeaway that I want you to remember that we're gonna talk about later on is that at the end of this, uh, we don't recover single, single cells. We're going to recover the colony, which means that the efficiency of the workflow and your success downstream is far, far higher. So to talk a little bit more about the culture dish and why it's so special, uh, the cell raft array is an innovative culture plate, but the form factor is very familiar to any biologist that's ever picked up a 60 millimeter dish. 
It allows us to seed our cells just using a standard strip header in a small volume of media, typically three mils. And the cells that we're seeding, anywhere from 1,000 cells to 20,000 or 40,000 cells, are all going to share that contiguous media volume within that central reservoir shown here. Now, within that gold area you see are fabricated thousands to tens of thousands of elastomeric microwells. Those microwells are what's going to provide the spatial segregation within the microarray. As the cells settle by gravity into the consumable, they're going to filter down into those microwells by a statistical distribution, at which point they will land on what is called a cell raft and attach to the growth surface. So the cell raft shown here in the inset is a microscale polystyrene tissue culture growth surface. It allows the cells to attach and grow just like any other large scale tea flask or dish that you've ever used in the past. But the key feature here is that it's on a micro scale level and that raft is actually fully releasable from the cell raft array when we're ready to retrieve our cells or colonies of interest. So if you look at the cartoon in the middle, you can see that as the cells settle, they can settle by this uh, statistical distribution. There'll be some empties potentially, some singles, some multiplets, et cetera, but we can distinguish all of that. They'll attach to the polystyrene cell raft. And of course, all of those singly segregated cells are sharing contiguous growth media, which means they're sharing growth factors, they're conditioning the media as a unit, and therefore the cell viability of those fragile edited cells is going to be far higher than depositing a single cell into a well. To prove the point to you so that you actually believe that this is true and an advantage of culturing your cells in a flask-like culture environment, uh, we performed this really cool experiment where we compared isolation of cells at different time points along the growth continuum to determine the effect of the number of cells on clonal formation downstream. As you can see here in the bright field image on the cell raft above, uh, we isolated a cell raft containing just one single induced pluripotent stem cell after one day of seeding. Uh, the outgrowth of the cells isolated at the one cell stage was only 10%, meaning only 10% of the 96 well plate that we isolated gave us a colony that was usable. If you compare this to the limiting dilution experiment that we did in parallel with this experiment, you can see they're identical. This should really come as no surprise given that a single cell in a well is a single cell in a well, kind of regardless of where you're starting from. Now, if we wait even 24 hours and we isolate that same cell population two days later after they've reached the two or the four cell stage, you can see our outgrowth jumps up to about 30%. If we wait to the small colony stage after three days of growth, when the cells have overcome that initial division state, our outgrowth goes up to over 80%. And if we wait the full growth cycle of this cell from the single cell stage and we isolate a confluent colony on day six, once that raft is transferred, within only two days, we have a massive iPSC colony that's already grown out with the right morphology that's ready to be used for downstream applications, and our clonal efficiency skyrockets. So the key takeaways here is that by isolating colonies, not single cells, we're able to improve our clonal outgrowth of our rare or fragile cells because we're actually isolating cells that have already overcome that barrier in a favorable environment rather than struggling as a single cell. So to compare the workflows more directly using gene editing, we wanted to do a head-to-head -head comparison in my lab, looking at what happened after you edited cells using CRISPR-Cas9 uh, in A549 cells. So in this workflow, both uh, arms started in the exact same position. We uh, purchased CRISPR-Cas9 constructs targeting P10 tumor suppressor, and we transduced those using lipid uh, nanoparticles into A549 uh, lung cancer cells. At the beginning of the workflow, all the cells were treated the same. After transfection, the cells were either put into the limiting dilution arm, during which they were expanded in a plate, underwent uh, puramycin antibiotic resistance selection, were expanded to a sizable population that actually survived, and then manually limiting diluted for clonal expansion. On the other side of the experiment, we took that transduced population just 24 hours after we put on the nanoparticles, and the cells were directly seeded onto the cell raft array. Once the cells were attached, they were scanned and monitored on the air system, and then those monoclonal colonies were directly isolated for further characterization and expansion off platform. <clears throat> So what you're looking at here is just one single example of a P10 edited A549 cultured on the cell raft array. So as you can see here in the bright field at day zero, there's that single A4, A549 24 hours after transfection. And we did co-transfect in a GFP plasmid uh, for marker expression to identify our, our transduced cells. And you can see that high degree of GFP expression here. 
uh, we are able to follow the growth of that colony over six days, as you can see in the bright field. And the key takeaways from this is that there's no pooled recovery or drug selection necessary in this version of the workflow. <laughs> Excuse me. Because we can seed cells on the array immediately after transduction with very few cell numbers, we're able to take advantage of that quick workflow to eliminate the need for the, the Hirsch drug selection. And more importantly, we're able to immediately visualize even transient fluorochromes. So this GFP is going to eventually fade. You can see that happening over the six days because it's not a stable transductant. And we can actually monitor that GFP and we can monitor the loss over time because of that time course imaging on the air system. This gives us a high degree of track and trace clonality. And in the case of this workflow, we had also co-transfected in another plasmid for RFP, which would be turned on in the event of a homologous recombination. So in this particular experiment, the red will come on as the editing events are occurring. So we can actually use the fluorescence, despite it being transient, to isolate clones that have a high degree of success because the probability is much higher in those cells than just a random surviving pooled population that survived drug selection. So I've just shown you a picture of one raft, but the important thing to note here is that the cell raft array really allows you to do this workflow at what I would consider to be a fairly unprecedented scale. Uh, what you're looking at is a zoom out of the entire array that you see here on the left-hand side. This is an actual stitched together image of every single field of view from the entire array. This represents 10,000 cell rafts containing hundreds to thousands of potential colonies that could be screened for your downstream workflow. And each of those red colonies might potentially be something that you would be interested in following up on. To put this in context for what this would mean in a traditional workflow, the corollary here is a stack of 1096 well plates to achieve the same number of potential clones for your downstream workflow. So the, the footprint here is substantially smaller to vastly improve your odds of finding your needle in a haystack cell and that special edit that you've been working for. Now, I already know what you're going to say to me. Jessica, this is lovely. I love all those pretty dots that you're showing me, but I have zero interest in looking through all of these pictures and finding the clone that I want. I don't have time for that. And my boss is certainly not gonna like seeing me at my computer all day. I totally agree with you. We don't wanna do it either. And I certainly don't wanna sit there and look through every single cell raft. And that is where the software really comes in to be your best friend in this process. So the cell raft cytometry software gives you a really unprecedented ability to look inside of your array follow your cells across time and space, and figure out which rafts contain the clones that you actually care about. So using the data generated off of the, uh, the air system, we can use the software to interrogate the scans by time points. So if you're looking over days or weeks, you can do that. If you're looking for cell size or cell shape, you can also use the software to identify those types of morphological features. And you know, importantly for these clonal, clonal development workflows, you're able to very easily and quickly use the software to identify cell wraps that contain a single cell that meets your criteria at day one. We're also able to follow that population of single cell wraps over time to ensure that the cells actually grow properly. If, for example, your gene edit conveys a, a growth advantage or a growth hindrance, you're able to monitor that as well. And if you're one of those lucky folks who has fluorescence as a marker for your cells of choice, you can also use the software to identify fluorescence. And an important thing to note here is that that fluorescence can be monitored at basically any point. So if you do have a transient fluorochrome, you can find the fluorescent cells at day one, even if they're not fluorescent at day six when you're ready to isolate your colony. After you have triaged that massive list of clones into the list of your top clones that you care most about that you want to recover, you can very easily use the software to map cell wraps for isolation. So I've said this word a few times, isolation, isolation, isolation. What does that actually mean in the context of the cell raft array and the cell raft technology? That's where the box comes in. So this is the cell raft air. It's a fully automated hands-free system that allows us to put the array on the deck of the instrument and actually recover those clones that we've been growing on the consumable. So to show you what this looks like uh, in principle, uh, on the deck of the air system, uh, when you're ready to recover your clones, uh, we put a 96 volt plate filled with growth media of choice onto the stage of the instrument. The array itself is positioned above an objective that has a release needle, and that's where uh, your pick list of rafts uh, is going to be talking to the air system to recover your clones. I'm going to play a movie here. 
So when you're actually ready to isolate, what happens is the air system finds your raft of choice containing your cell of interest. The objective containing the release needle actuates through the floor of that elastomeric bottom. A wand dips into the fluid from above to pick up the cell raft, and it moves it over to the collection plate for deposit of the cell raft. Now, this is where I like to say it's not magic, it's magnets. Uh, this whole thing is possible because that cell raft has been doped with iron nanoparticles, which render it movable by a magnetic force. So that wand that you see dipping into the fluid has a magnet, has a magnet in it. The magnet allows you to pick up the raft, deposit it into the collection plate as an oppositional magnet below the array and below the collection plate drops the raft into the plate. It's incredibly gentle. It's very safe for your cells. So what don't you see here? There's no fluidics, there's no tubing, there's no sheath fluid, there's no PBS. Everything is happening in physiologic media with your cells still attached to the raft the entire time. There's no aspiration, no enzymatic dissociation, no cell squeezing. It's incredibly gentle on your cells. Now, after you've actually transferred that raft over to a collection plate, what happens to your cells? This is a time-lapse movie of a clone actually growing off of the raft. You can see the cells on the raft after transfer. They continue to expand over this 10-day time period. The raft will eventually wash away, and you have a massive colony that's ready for expansion under normal conditions for your experiment. Again, completely manipulation-free, totally passive, no additional manipulation of your cells necessary. So to show you uh, the data from that comparison workflow that we did using the cell raft air, <clears throat> in this pre uh, A549 workflow, you can see off of the cell raft at day 11. So this is day 11 post-transfection. Uh, you can see the cell raft sitting in the middle of the well there and an absolutely massive edited colony coming off of the uh, raft in the dish. That colony was actually ready for expansion, so it was trypsinized and replated, and you can see there's the raft still in the well, but the cells are now more dispersed, and they're happy and healthy and ready for further expansion. In contrast, down below, you can see one of the lone straggling survivors from the limiting dilution workflow, and uh, you don't need to be a, a card-carrying cell biologist to tell the difference in these two colonies. It's quite obvious that these cells are far less happy. The colony is substantially smaller, and even the morphology looks different compared to the clone off of the array. Uh, it's not quite fair, but we split this colony anyway. And as you can see in the panel next to it, uh, those cells did not really survive the split, and were certainly not ready to be propagated after only 12 days post-transduction. Now, the really key feature here is that in any other workflow where you're putting a single cell in a well, this is what you get to look at in a dish. All you can see is that colony sitting in a dish, and you have to kind of hope that it came from a single cell. The magic of the cell raft technology and the air system is that I can go back and look at exactly where that colony came from. This is the actual cell raft that gave rise to the clone that you see on the right hand side. So at day zero, you can see that beautiful single cell after transduction, the colony begins to grow. And then in 12 days, we're already at the point where the clones are ready for expansion. In contrast, in the limiting dilution workflow, I put a bunch of question mark boxes here. As hard as we would try to find these single cells in the well of a 96 well plate, it's virtually impossible to have a high degree of confidence that your clone has started from a single cell. So even though we might have clones that resulted from this limiting dilution workflow, I have no guarantee that it was actually an edited clone that I care about, and I might spend weeks or months trying to figure that out, as opposed to the air system where we already knew that these cells were fluorescently tagged, they had a high degree of probability of being edited, and I could get to my downstream analysis much quicker. To underscore that point, if you really compare the two workflows, to get to a sizable colony formation with enough clones to do next-gen sequencing in the limiting dilution workflow, it took us 32 days. In contrast, uh, using cell raft technology, we were able to do this same exact workflow in only 18 days with a 10 times higher cloning efficiency. Only 5% of the wells that were seeded on limiting dilution gave rise to a colony that could be interrogated, whereas over 50% of the cells that were isolated from the array uh, gave rise to a colony that could be screened. And the important thing to note here is we didn't even isolate all of the clones that we could have off of the array. You know, you're sort of only going to isolate as many as you're interested in screening, but there's usually hundreds more that you could go back to if you needed them on the platform. <clears throat> so to give a different example of uh, this gene editing workflow, uh, so I just showed you a knockout workflow, and I'm gonna show you a knock-in workflow uh, in a very difficult to work with induced pluripotent stem cell line. Uh, so this workflow was done in collaboration with a lab at North Carolina State University. Uh, the researcher approached us to do a collaboration because they had been trying to generate a very challenging reporter cell line for their work and had been able to had been unable to do so. Uh, they had access to several of these low pressure sorters as 
as well as uh, limiting dilution and high pressure flow sorting. And despite months of effort, the efforts had failed. The cells were not able to be transduced. And if the gene was transduced, the cells would ultimately die. So in this particular workflow, uh, the researcher had already designed their guide RNAs and their constructs, and the goal was to knock in a GFP to their target uh, in a, to test a neuronal, uh, in a neuronal cell line. Uh, this workflow was a little bit different for us, largely because of the efficiency of this workflow. So these cells are hard to transfect, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning, knowing that the cell line was difficult to use, it was a large construct, uh, hard to knock in gene. The approach that we took was more of a pooled approach. So we electroporated the iPSCs using the uh, electroporation method, and then we seeded them directly off the electroporator onto the cell raft array. So no recovery period, no pooled expansion, just right onto the array. We identified and isolated polyclonal cell wraps for pooled expansion because the viability of these cells was so poor after electroporation that we isolated polyclones. And then the researcher did downstream orthogonal confirmation to identify which of the polyclonal pools actually had the putative edit. You can see that here and the dark bands, uh, yeah, well B3 and well C3 both had the gene of interest uh, that derived from this uh, pool that you see here on the left. So it was a polyclone, which you can tell by the imaging, and the cells did in fact carry the transgene of interest. Now, because of the cloning ability of the cell raft array, we could take that polyclonal population and clean it up using the air system. So we took the polyclonal line that was positive for the transgene, we expanded it to a sizable population, and then we reseeded it onto a new cell raft array to actually do monoclonal development. You can see an example of that here. At day zero, there's that single iPSC at day zero. We can watch the colony grow, and by day eight, we have a sizable colony that's grown off raft. We were able to isolate hundreds of monoclonal colonies into 96 well plates for characterization. We expanded those clones for downstream analysis. And then the researcher again performed genomic DNA, PCR on those monoclonal colonies to confirm the edit. As you can see here, a, a large majority of the clones that we provided were in fact positive for the transgene of choice. And overall, we were able to obtain 17 edited monoclonal cell lines that were correct by both Sanger sequencing and PCR, as well as fluorescence expression. And this whole workflow, starting from the polyclonal step all the way to the end care characterization was completed in about 30 days. So a vast difference to the scale and the speed at which the researcher had previously been able to execute. Now, the coolest part of this project was that they actually had plans for this cell line, and they weren't able to do the actual downstream characterization that they cared about because the poor scientist had simply been trying to get her gene of interest into the cells. After we created the cell lines and she had validated them, she was able to take the edited iPSC line that we provided to her and differentiate it into two-dimensional forebrain neurons, as you see here on the left-hand side of the screen. Those neurons were positive for the neuronal marker TUJ1. And as you can see in that sort of yellowish looking color in the spots, that is the transgene that we inserted into the cells. So uh, the cell line works, the transgene turned on when the cells were the appropriate differentiation state, and they were able to be fully matured uh, out to 15 weeks in a dish. In our lab uh, here, uh, we were able to take the same cell line and do the three-dimensional version of this workflow. So we took the edited iPSC line, we differentiated it into three-dimensional cerebral organoids using the air system, isolated those organoids off the platform, and then were able to characterize the growth and GFP expression in that iPSC line uh, off platform, as you can see here. So in the bright field, there's that beautiful uh, cerebral uh, organoid with the folded morphology, and the organoid is in fact positive for the transgene that we inserted. So I think this project really highlights how the right tools can allow you to move your science along faster um, instead of struggling with the very beginning upstream arm of your workflow. And you can get to the stuff that you really care about and create that cool science much, much faster. So some advantages to the cell raft technology that I've I highlighted for you at this point are that the direct to array workflow, meaning you skip that whole laborious expansion uh, drug selection step, it really does eliminate the need for the large cell numbers that you have to have in these other workflows, as well as for potentially introducing false uh, positives or false uh, data into your into your cloning population. The longer you have to grow these cells, the harder you have to put them under selection pressure, the less likely it's going to be that your cells behave themselves in your actual assay. 
Importantly, the flask-like culture environment of the array improves the survival of even low abundance edited clonal colonies. So you don't have to worry about those fragile cells up and dying on you because the favorable culture environment is going to improve your success of finding even those rare needle in a haystack clones. Because of this, we're able to generate these gene edited cell lines weeks faster than traditional methods, which, as I've just shown you, means that you get to do accelerated phenotypic characterization and downstream analysis and get to that paper or that endpoint that you really care about. So to that end, everything I've shown you this far has uh, been all internal data or collaborations in my lab, uh, but I, I really like to use our user data to highlight the breadth of what's happening out in the research field with folks who have access to the cell raft air uh, and what they're doing in their own labs. And I think what you'll see through these next few case studies is kind of a common theme. All of these researchers are working with complicated cell lines that are hard to work with. They're trying to put in multiple genes that may or may not be large or complex. They're trying to answer questions no one has answered before, and they're trying to do it at a scale that would be incredibly challenging to do if they did not have access to this technology. So the first example that I'm going to highlight for you is coming out of the Aruda lab, uh, is, is coming out of a lab at UNC, uh, Aruda et al. They were looking at cohesin, which regulates 3D genome organization and gene expression. Uh, they wanted to use mouse embryonic stem cells to generate stable knockout lines for two different genes, PDS5A and PDS5B, to elucidate the functions of the differential cohesin complexes that form uh, with these two subunits. They had a fluorescent marker available to them. So they used the cell raft air system to isolate, it, edit, to isolate edited M-cherry or GFP positive clonal colonies from the cell raft array. In this particular workflow, they were using CRISPR with uh, an, a, a lipid-based uh, transduction methodology. And as you can see here from their data, uh, they were able to generate numerous clones for both of their transgenes of interest. They did immunoblotting to confirm orthogonally that those were in fact clonal colonies that had lost the PDS5A and PDS5B. They then used those colonies to do differential gene expression to look at the effects of uh, transcription after the knockout of these genes. And they were able to show that the knockout lines exhibit only partially overlapping effects on their gene target. In this next example, uh, this is another example of a knock-in stem cell line uh, using CRISPR technology. Simon et al. used CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing in human embryonic stem cells, so not mouse this time, but human, uh, that are carrying the uh, scent cert 6 allele. So this is a really cool project where they had uncovered a certain variant of the cert 6 uh, gene in centenarians, so folks who had reached over 100 years old. And they all had this common uh, sort of longevity gene uh, in their genomes that conferred potential longevity. It's also been shown to confer longevity in Drosophila and mice, and they wanted to investigate the effect of this particular um, uh, allele on human embryonic stem cells. They used the cell raft array to identify monoclonal colonies after electroporation using the neon, and they confirmed the editing by Sanger sequencing. They generated two independent knock-in clones for validation, and they were then able to differentiate those embryonic stem cells into mesenchymal stem cells to look at the phenotypic effects. Uh, as you can see here from the data and the, in the blot in the right hand box with the red outline around it, the sent CERT6 knock in cells exhibited higher protein levels of CERT6, suggesting that the knock in was successful. And they also found that this gene conferred genomic stability, which obviously plays a key role in human longevity. Uh, they also found that cells that were harboring this CERT6 allele were able to exhibit a higher degree of repair. And they also had an attenuated response to treatment with a DNA damaging agent MMS. In this last example I'm going to show you, uh, this is a large-scale approach to looking for unintended on-target effects of CRISPR editing in, uh, embryonic, in, in uh, embryonic stem cells. <clears throat> so uh, Lackner et al. developed what they call the SAFE donor approach, which stands for Sequence Ascertained Favorable Editing. As I told you way back in the beginning of the talk, one of the key uh, issues with CRISPR gene editing is unintended uh, off-target or on-target effects. So what this group wanted to use the air system to look at was whether or not uh, this methodology would allow them to identify the on-target effects um, using the method. Using the air system after transduction, uh, this was a, actually an electroporation using nucleofection, they were able to isolate 850 human embryonic stem cell clones with safe donors to detect copy number changes and clones with gene conversion. So 850 embryonic stem cell clones by any other method would have likely been highly unattainable. 
They isolated those clones uh, for genomic analysis downstream. And for each of the two uh, genes they were looking at, TEX2 in uh, bubble A and TTF1 in bubble B, uh, they were able to isolate 437 and 435 clones respectively, and then examine the off-target or on-target effects of gene editing, uh, whether it was uh, wild type, intended, the intended missense, or whether it was uh, both. And so that in that way, they were able to actually use the technology to get a very keen look at how this technology that they developed could uh, improve on target, uh, unintended on target effects of CRISPR gene editing. So between all of these case studies, I hope I have impressed upon you that gene editing should be easy. It should not be the bottleneck to uh, progress and it should not be the bottleneck to your research and your downstream efforts. And hopefully I have convinced you during the course of this talk that uh, we have overcome a lot of the bottlenecks that happen in this workflow using cell raft technology. Um, this highly inefficient process using the cell raft array, we can do gene editing in weeks, not months. Taking a tremendous amount of time is eliminated because we can perform rapid imaging. You know, we can scan in five to 10 minutes over a matter of days, shortening the time to clonal propagation, and the cells that grow out are going to grow much faster than they would under all of these other methodologies. The scale here is going to greatly improve that pain point of not delivering the number of clones that you need because one single array that uses three mils of media and one pipette tip is equivalent to the screening power of 1096 well plates which is going to mean that you're going to get hundreds to thousands of monoclonal colonies from a single consumable with very little upfront uh, addition to your workflow uh, in terms of media, pipette tips, et cetera. And then most importantly, uh, you don't have to worry about that guarantee of edit or clonality anymore. I've shown you how we can visually confirm that edit very quickly using the CellRap technology and how we can even confirm in some cases the presence of the edit or the presence of the transgene using fluorescence imaging which means ultimately for your research, you're going to have a much more streamlined development pipeline, enabling you to do the science that actually matters much faster and get out of the vicious cycle of selling development into the actual research that you care about. So uh, with that, I'm gonna launch a final poll question because hopefully I have tantalized your interest and you are curious about how the cell wrapped air system can benefit your workflows and your research group. If you're interested in learning more, I would love for you to visit uh, cellmicrosystems.com. And even better, if you are really excited about this technology and you wanna request a demo or talk more with me, I would love to get in contact with you and be happy to answer any questions that you have. So with that, I'm going to conclude the presentation portion of the webinar, and I would be more than happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Hartman, for that comprehensive and insightful presentation. We'll now move on to the Q&A session. I see we've already received several interesting questions from our attendees. Uh, first of all, do you need to use a fluorescent reporter or antibody state? You don't need to use a fluorescent reporter or antibody staining, but you're absolutely able to if that's amenable to your workflow. And it certainly improves the uh, confidence that you might have. The beauty of the air system and the software is that everything can be done in the bright field. All of the algorithms that allow you to find your cells of interest and your colonies of interest are rooted in the bright field. So for our researchers who are very sensitive to putting dyes or fluorochromes or antibodies on their cells, it's not a requirement. Uh, and you're also able to stain directly on the consumable if you want to. So if you have a cell surface marker or if your gene is going to turn on or off, you can use that at will. So it's not a requirement, but it's certainly an option if it's available to you. Okay. Is it possible to coat the cell wraps, for example, with matrogen? Absolutely. So the cell wraps are basically just standard tissue culture polystyrene at a micro scale level. They can be coated with any extracellular substrate that you would like to coat with. We have validated at this point internally somewhere between a dozen or so, and uh, we can provide recommendations on what might work for your workflow. It typically requires very little adjustment of your traditional workflow in a plate to get started with the cell raft array. Um, so you can use uh, matrogel or, or, matri or any laminin, uh, poly-D lysine, poly-L lysine, uh, any of those coatings will work just fine on the platform. Okay, next question is, if you have more than 96 successful rafts, can you fill more than 196 well plate? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Absolutely. You are only limited to isolating as many as you have the energy to isolate. You can isolate all of them as you wish. Uh, the great thing about the technology is that that elastomeric bottom is self-sealing. So when you dissociate, when you actuate through and you pop out that raft, it seals right back behind you. So you're not limited to a one-stop shop isolation like you would be with a sorter where you're trypsinizing all of your cells at one time, even if they're not all ready. You can isolate on a day three, a day four, a day five, and you can even isolate three, four, five plates, depending on how many colonies you actually need. Now, I would caution you, uh, a lot of our users are rather shocked uh, to find that when they isolate three or four 96 well plates, they then have four plates with 90% or higher outgrowth. And then you're left with hundreds of colonies that you have to screen downstream. And, and most people don't have an appetite for that. Uh, so it's a bit of a mind shift when you're uh, learning the technology because most people think they want more clones, but the benefit of the air system is that you really have the right clones and as many of the right clones as you need. So you don't have to feel like you need to isolate three or 400 rafts to be successful in your downstream analysis. Great. Um, will there be need for adding more media or will the media last for as long as the cultivation occurs? Ah, another great question. Uh, that is a little bit dependent on your cell type of choice. Now, our stem cell folks uh, who are used to feeding their cells every day, you're certainly welcome to go in there and feed the cells uh, at some frequency. We typically recommend half media changes rather than a full exchange because the cells are still fragile and conditioning the medium. For your typical cell line development workflow with a cancer cell line or, or any other really robust bus cell type, you absolutely do not need to change the media. Uh, there's very low evaporation rates. The media will last the entire culture period because they're really only on the consumable for about three to five days. And that's kind of what we recommend because we don't want to take off that lovely conditioned media that the cells have worked so hard to condition. There's very few cells there and you almost never really see the media changing color over the growth period um, on the array itself. Okay. Are we able to store the array with cells, especially if one would like to do in from domain deletion screen? You are able to store the arrays. I'm not exactly sure what the context here is, but I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, so the array itself goes in and out of the incubator while you're doing your culture period. That's the nice thing about the instrument. You don't have to keep the consumable on the instrument the entire duration of the workflow. You can actually keep it in a standard tissue culture incubator, freeing the instrument up for other users on the platform. So you can certainly keep the array as long as you'd like it. If you're doing things off of fixed cells or fixed tissue, you can absolutely fix the array. So you can put paraformaldehyde or, or methanol or something like that on the array to fix the cells in place and then isolate later. Uh, and then also one of the workflows I didn't talk much about today, but was highlighted in the last example that I showed is that group was not interested in clonal expansion. They were only really interested in uh, downstream omics. And so you can isolate directly off the platform for uh, nucleic acid recovery. And you could do that from either fixed or live cells, depending on your need. And of course, they can also be stored in the fridge. So once you fix them, you can store the arrays in the fridge uh, if you need them. Okay. Can you find my rare event or low efficiency edit? Yeah, absolutely. That's our favorite workflow. Um, it's always really fun to find that rare needle in a haystack um, edit. Uh, it a little bit depends on what the edit is and how rare it is, but we have been able to demonstrate um, as low as one in a thousand, and I'm guessing we could do even lower if we had to. If you have a fluorochrome, it makes it really, really easy to find that one raft with a green cell. Uh, but on the flip side, even if you don't have a marker or you don't have a clear idea of which of your rare edits are going to be there, the nice thing here is the scale is really tremendous. So even if the edit is rare and you're hunting for it in a population that is struggling in other workflows, you'll have lots of options available to you on the array that you can isolate for downstream characterization. Okay. Do you see cells that migrate from cell rack to cell rack? For example, cells move around a lot of nitrogel, and if the colony outgrows the raft or micro well, there may be migration to a different population. Yeah, no, that's a good question. The short answer is no, not very often. Uh, now, it can happen uh, if the cells get overgrown. So we have a lot of guidance for our users uh, internally and externally on how to mitigate that. Uh, all of these details about how you seed your cells on the platform are, are totally user defined. You can mitigate that by uh, changing your cell seeding density. We also encourage users to isolate earlier uh, in those cases because we don't want to give the cells an opportunity to overgrow the confines of the microwell. But in general, it's not a problem as long as you are cognizant 
description of the properties of your cell type. Um, and also we have different array formats. The rafts themselves come in different sizes. They come in a 100 micron by 100 micron square and a 200 micron by 200 micron square. So you can also mitigate that by using the larger cell raft format because they have a larger growth surface and they're less inc inclined to get over confluent on that smaller growth surface. Okay. Um, this person says, great talk. How can Thank we you. leverage technology to perform pooled screens and replace whole genome Cas9 libraries to do negative and positive screens? Ah, yes, absolutely. We have uh, several users who do that pulled screen approach. Um, a little bit depends on the power that you're looking to power that pulled screen approach with and how many guides or hairpins, uh, if you're old school like me, are in your pooled library. Uh, but you are absolutely able to do pooled screening. Uh, we have several users who do that. Um, there's a, a manuscript, so whoever asked the question, if you're interested, there's a manuscript on our website. They call it Raft Seek, where they're using a pooled genome screen to identify um, variants uh, in for rare diseases. And they're isolating thousands of rafts for downstream omics to look for uh, the, 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 the target knockout sequence. Um, so that's one of my favorite parts, actually, about the array, is that it's not just a clone picker. You can actually phenotypically screen on the array and match phenotype to genotype in these types of pooled screens. So let's say you're one of those lucky folks who has a morphology change or a translocation uh, from cytoplasm to nucleus or something like that that's visible on the array. You can actually use the imaging capabilities of the air system to link to your downstream omics, which is very, very rare for other technologies. So rather than doing these sort of pooled screens where you're dumping all of your cells into a, a large scale screening approach, you can actually hand pick the clones that you think may have had an edit that you care about. Okay, and then a person's asking if the papers shown in the end of this presentation are available on the homepage. They absolutely are, and we can provide them in the resource library as well. So the papers are all available for viewing. Uh, we have a very extensive resource library on the website. If you go to cellmicrosystems.com and click on uh, resource library, you can sort the publications by topic, by um, application, uh, and you can look at all those manuscripts that are available. And we provide a summary of all of those papers. Um, there's, about, there's over 50, I think, at this point. So if you don't want to read the whole paper, you can get a really good idea of what the research uh, is, is doing in each of those papers. Just by reading the summary on the website. Okay. Uh, how long do the cells need to recover? That's a good question. Again, it's somewhat cell independent. Some of the hardier cell types, they don't need very long at all. Uh, some of the more gentler or more fragile cell lines need a little bit longer. Uh, in general, the direct to array workflow is, is very, very gentle on the cells. So you don't tend to see that sort of large scale die off like you see with other methods because the cells are, are sort of happier and they're attached. Um, you're really getting sort of the best of the best. Um, now, you're, you're still more than welcome to do a pre-screen approach if that's your if that's your druthers. You can let them recover the normal way for a day or two in the in the plates and then go on to the array. And that's a perfectly acceptable way of doing it if you don't want to run the risk of having you know, cell death on the array, et cetera. Um, but in general, I would say between 24 and 48 hours, the cells are ready to go on platform. Okay. Uh, how many lasers are built in and can it be customized? Good question. Uh, so it's not a laser-based system. It's LED-based. Uh, it built in. It comes with a three-color fluorescence. We have uh, red, green, and blue. So the blue is, is DAPI. Uh, the green is FITC-488. And the red is Texas Red 594. It is not customizable, uh, largely because the goal for us is to be a, a very agile and rapid system, so you can't swap out any of the LEDs. But the nice thing about the platform is that you can use the three colors that are on board the system for your initial screening. And then as most labs already have available to them other high content imagers or flow sorters or analyzers that allow you to do 17 color fluorescence with lots of different channels, you now have a plate of clones that can be characterized rather than trying to use all of those expensive complex lengthy methods to find the clone. Okay, and I've had several people ask about using it for suspension cells. Yep, absolutely. So obviously with suspension cells, it comes with a little bit of a development workflow to adapt the suspension cells to your workflow. If you're using a suspension cell line that is amenable or you are amenable to letting your cells attach to a coating, it's absolutely doable. So some cell lines, like for example, the 293 Freestyles, they don't need a coating because they were adapted from an adherent cell line and they'll just go right back and attach and then go back into suspension. More often than not, if you're talking about an immune cell or a, you know, a, a myeloma cell, something like that, um, it's going to need to be adapted to a coating on the platform. 
fairly straightforward to do. We have protocols that coach you on how to do that, uh, but it does require some cell to cell optimization to get the conditions right. Um, and you have to be willing to let your cells stick down, but it's a pretty quick workflow. The air system does really well with them because they're round and beautiful and high contrast. So you can find them really easily. They'll grow for just a few days on the array and then they can be isolated off the rafts into the 96 volt plates. And then the cool thing is they go right back into passive cell suspension. So it's a very easy workflow from that regard because you're not trypsinizing or using any kind of um, enzymatic dissociation. All you have to do is go in there with a pipetter and triturate them and they pop off the raft and go back into suspension. So it's absolutely tractable, does require you to be amenable to changing your workflow a little bit and doing some optimization. And we do have an application note on the website uh, that allows you to sort of see some of the data from that particular workflow if you're interested. Okay, great. That's all the time we have for today. If we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with you afterwards via email. And as we conclude today's webinar, I'd like to extend our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Hartman for sharing her expertise and to all of you for your active participation. We would appreciate it if you could respond to a brief three question survey after the webinar has ended. A recording of this session along with additional resources will be sent via email and available on our website in a couple of days. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much.